In the 12 years Sagebrush Coffee has been in existence, I've learned a ton. I wish I could go back in time and tell 12 years ago me all of the things that we've learned. And so Jonathan and I started a series, and you can see the whiteboard behind us talking through ground zero of what we wish we had known when we started Sagebrush Coffee. What are some of the things that we could have done? What are some of the ways we could have set up the business? And really, as we thought through opening our coffee shop, um, what aspects of that could we have done to make it better? So hopefully you're interested in those types of things. I know when we get interviewees, they're always looking to open a coffee shop one day. I know a lot of people want to, and so hopefully we can share some of the things we've learned and give you a chance to learn this before you have to experience it. So if I were starting over with Sagebrush Coffee all together, what would I, what right. would I need to know when I'm thinking about it? Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely the first thing is what, kind of coffee business do you want to be yeah and that's when most people ask me for advice that's usually where i start because you know we picked our niche in the coffee market partly because it's where we love to be um and partly that's just kind of how it worked out for us uh, but like there's you could be anywhere from a multi roaster who wants to show other roasting roast like other coffee roasters products to um to kind of where we are which it's hey. like trying to find the best coffee in the world and pre and show off the producers the best way we know how yeah um and you could even go back a step of a like white labeling your own coffee and just trying to really play with the barista side of the business yeah craft focus yeah yeah i think there's a with coffee as a major giant umbrella industry there's so many different ways routes you can take if you're far more interested in what specialty coffee has to offer these are kind of the categories that yep you're locked into but you know there's plenty and of people who are like starbucks who are like dutch bros who are like kind of your more traditional like Italian vibe early 2000s not really much um you know the aesthetics are different too so it's a matter of what are you, what would the person starting off be and what are they particularly interested in today as a consumer because that will translate to what they can present to others as well. yeah um, well Lens, I remember early on talking to someone who um I mean, he basically said he would never open a coffee shop unless it had a drive through because in terms of just making pure profit, um, turning customers as quick as possible is the goal and a drive through makes that happen. And yeah. so if you're really just trying to go figure out, Hey, how do I make the most amount of money possible with the least amount of work? That's a really different business than a lot of coffee shops. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the more focused you become with what you want to be the more successful that you will be yeah because given that it's such a wide scope in coffee you'll find your niche and solidify yourself with a cult following kind of no matter what you end up with like if you enjoy creative syrupy um, like sweet stuff drinks you enjoy making things with whipped cream and blended and all that you know that's not at all what we're about we have found our niche in our profitable coffee shop without that. Right. And there's dozens of coffee shops that are profitable with that. What, what stands out to me is something I saw online is like, as a creator or as an artist, what you bring to the table is your taste. Um, so equally, I think as someone who is like looking to start a coffee shop, what you're bringing to you know, you're not one amongst many voices. You're actually your own unique voice with your own experiences and taste. And so working that into the fold as much as possible is super important, whether you enjoy, you know, something kind of like sweet, or if you're like a connoisseur of black coffee, those are both, um, those are both tastes that are equally as valid as far as a business standpoint goes. You can yep. step into the landscape of coffee with those different 
you know, approaches and still be a successful coffee shop. Which that, like, if someone had told me that 12 years ago or whatever, I would have probably been way more focused early on. I remember vividly, I mean, when I started the business, I remember thinking, there's 100 million coffee drinkers in America. I don't need that many of them to have similar palettes to me to be a successful coffee business. But then at one point I had a customer who was asking about dark roasts. We don't really do dark roasts or what most people think of as dark roasts. And, and I offered a custom roast profile and his response was so, um, it was such an education for me because he basically said, when you figure out the type of coffee business you wanna be, call me. Um, and it was rude in the moment and in hindsight, it was educational because it was like, yeah, I need to go figure out what kind of coffee business I wanna be. Yeah. Um, and, and we did, and we picked, like we kind of evolved a little bit in those first few years and then just ran with what we love about this industry. Yeah. What will keep you moving forward ultimately will be what you enjoy doing. Yeah. And if perfecting your craft in espresso is what you enjoy doing, uh, then that will be what you are. Yeah, as a company, you want that to translate as much as possible. Well, and it has such a ripple effect. Like, you know, I've tried over the years to source and sell great Indonesian coffees. And the reality is our roast profiles that we enjoy don't cater to that or that region. And and so at some point in the life of the business, I've just given up on it because it's like, yeah. no, I can't be what I want to be and sell coffees from that region and have them be what people want when right. they look for coffees from that region. Yeah, it's it's a matter of you'll say no to some people in order yeah. to say yes well to exactly the people that you want to see. Yep. Yes and so it's it's very important to to spend time thinking through what kind of business do you want to be? Um, and I mean, for people that know Sagebrush, they know we're an in-house roaster and an importer and spend a lot of time just sourcing um, many times auction level coffees, whether they we buy at auction or not that's what we've done. And so because of that, um, and, and we, we kind of did it backwards by starting with an online business instead of a coffee shop. But because, because we knew who we were really well by the time we opened the coffee shop, that had a ripple effect in everything we did about right. setting up the coffee shop. Yeah. Yeah. And it adds to your credibility because no matter what, someone's going to walk in, they want you to be confident where you're at. Yeah. Um, and to boldly say, no, we don't have cream, we don't do blended drinks, you automatically kind of are deducting as a, con as a consumer who these people are in the grand scheme of the coffee yeah. industry. And I, I think it's really easy because there's a coffee shop on every corner to try to be all things to all people. And I think that's where you get lost in the noise. Yeah, that's where you become just like any other coffee shop. Yeah. Being a distinct, focused subsection of the industry will be how you get people coming back every day. Yeah. Not just trying it out and being, you know, mediocrity is in that kind of middle ground of, you know, yes, you do this, yes, you do this, yes, you do this, yes, you do this, you know. It's like the, the cheesecake factory, you don't want a book for a menu. Right. You want to hone in on which, what exactly you want to be. Yeah. Which doesn't mean and Cheesecake people, Factory is successful too. Right. So. And, it do, and it doesn't mean that the people that say, hey, I want to really focus on specialty drinks with the, the whipped cream and the blended whatever, um, don't like that. There's a great market for that. There is there are a lot of people who are looking for that and looking to move away from the corporate, you know, Starbucks of the world to go find a, a small business that does that great. Um, just because we've chosen not to be that doesn't mean that that's not something that something to be. Explore. And you could possibly make more money than we do doing that. Um, and so it really comes down to what do you want to be? What do you love? What do you love about the industry? And your customers will feel that you love it the same way they do. Yeah. And they'll want to come to that. Exactly. Um, um, I think that kind of trickles down into um, some of the more practical. How do you want to present yourself? Because at a foundation level, this is who you are. Um, and now it's a matter of communicating that. Yeah. And first impressions, what I've seen is in our shop's aesthetic, that grants a first impression of someone who 
hasn't spoken a word to any of the baristas yet as to kind of what we're all about and who we are and how we operate. Uh, we're a huge shop with a bunch of industrial space delegated towards what we do for production. And we have a sharp, clean, mid-century aesthetic in the coffee shop itself where the customers will be sitting. And that juxtaposition is certainly an aspect of what draws people in, seeing right. kind of all that we do behind the scenes right from the get-go, as well as in the fold, seeing a comfortable space with lots of seating and a, a place to be, to work, and to meet with people. So I think present presentation, you know, it's, it's certainly as focused as you are here, it's as mandatory to be focused in that as well. Yep. You know, buying the cheap end of everything, you know, you're going to want to set an investment in some level of your presentation. And with a limited budget, it's fully understandable to not go all out. Um, and we'll probably get into the economics of it. But taking out a loan to do so might be something that's not a good idea either. But certainly the focus remains the same. You want to be you want to be making those calls, even if they're calls against certain things. You want yeah. to be thinking through and calling the shots as to where you want to delegate that presentation as a shot. Um, and I guess we can just talk through how we thought about it. And I think what I'm reminded of is when we met, talking through color scheme was huge as far as tying in the elements as far as interior design goes to the branding that we have had already. I mean, we've, yeah, that was... we've been a roastery for ever and orange has been our primary color. Uh, what we wanted to steer clear of was it being orange everything because orange right. can be really overpowering. So yep. um, how do you presentation? Oh, how do I presentation? <laughs> uh, but for us in what is probably a helpful exercise, and this is probably this is probably the tail end of a build out because now you're thinking through amenities and tables, chairs, menu, decor, what you're hanging on your wall, uh, the seating. Well, and that was, it was uh, so helpful to us because we were debating a lot around what do you invest money in? Do you buy a $30,000 espresso machine and go cheaper in other areas? Do you buy a $20,000 espresso machine and then you have $10,000 in budget for other things? Like you, you, everyone has a finite amount of money and so you can't just spend it all. And so where do we put our focus? And it was, it was kind of just the pivot, like you said, when we figured out our palette and the pivot where we said, okay, let's talk about our colors. And they were basically, what was it? White, black, and orange or white, yeah, gray, and was, orange uh, or something like that? Um, yeah, given how much we had, we, my desire was to keep as much white as possible because the shops, honestly, in the surrounding area, the aesthetic, of one with a lot of dark colors versus one with a lot of light colors. They're just, there's a different emotion that you get as you step into each of those shops. You can yeah. feel, it's easy to feel cramped, to feel uncomfortable in a space that's really dark and just not comfortable. Well, and it didn't help us that we, you know, we leased a former bar that was set up to be really dark. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, how do we brighten this space? Yeah. Um, and nice. so I remember us going, okay, well, let's do white as much as possible. Let's do, you know, grays where we need to, um, and orange where we can. And then we started talking through materials and we said, okay, when that equals woods, these are the, the complement. And so yeah. we're like the we wood that we wanted. Dark wood. Yeah. We don't, we don't want, we want our wood. We saw the different samples that we were looking to do, which is another piece is the ability to bootstrap any ability that you have to bootstrap anything is probably going to be preferable right. which that will be a consistent theme but for us we had the opportunity uh, your dad does woodworking and so the opportunity to buy just some planks of wood cut them up and tie them together sand them down and seal them um, that was a much lower cost for us for some nice long-lasting solid wood tables yeah that that was a game changer. And with that came the opportunity to look at specific types of wood and kind of get a gauge for what the feel of each of them was. And there's obviously 
probably hundreds in different types of wood. So narrowing it down to here's a dark wood, here's a really, really light, basically white wood. Here's um, a few in-betweens, grayish, um, and what we landed on was more brown, orange tone wood to sit as the primary wood that we used for our shop, as well as a secondary African unique imported wood for some of the more, um, what do you call it, highlights of yes. different wood tones in the shop. But that really helped set the tone for, we created a warm, hypothetic orange environment without needing to buy orange paint to establish that. Yeah. And so it's a matter of, it's a matter of color when it comes to the interior design and thinking through how can, how can I tie that in with what I have thinking through in my branding, um, whether it's your logo or just the bags, your color bags or whatever, um, your branding is going to have a specific set of color. And so what can I do to not be hyper on the nose? Like, well, we're orange, so let's paint all the walls orange thinking through it a bit more intentionally as to how can I create a space that brings both a comfortable environment and one that correlates with what I'm presenting myself in my media, whether, you know, logo, Instagram, everything. So yep. um, that's certainly a, a matter of consideration. And the other side of the coin is kind of the darker aesthetic is something that's classic to what you see in like late nineties, early 2000 coffee shops. You see a lot of dark tones, a lot of black. Um, and so it's a matter of, it circles back to what's your personality? What's your taste? What do you enjoy? You want to bolster that as much as possible um, and be confident in that. So it's like, well, you know, if you grew up and love espresso was a barista in the early 2000s or whatever and you know you're tatted up and you love skating and things like that like that's a subset of the coffee culture that embraces sort of that darker aesthetic so that's that's a category where tying that in to your shop's aesthetic is something that people would be drawn to right and there's lots of shops that have that too and yeah obviously there's and frankly it's probably a little easier to keep clean but yeah <laughs> um the the other thing that outside of color that I think was super important for us was when Jeff, my friend who's an architect, who looked at the space before we even rented it and and had a vision of, hey, you want people to walk in, place their order up front, but behind them see everything you're doing production wise because we are a roaster first. And and you don't want to hide that in a back corner or another room, but you want to have that be very open and, and obvious to people. Um, that was very significant for us. And yeah. and that that conversation with Jeff rang in my ears the entire time. We were thinking through what do we want this to look like. Yeah. Um, and, and even today, there's some aspects of it where it's like we could put the roasters more up front if we had it to do over again and have them more obvious to people. Display and things. Um, yeah. And the reality was we you had a hood already had. and it yeah. was I wasn't going to move a hood for five figures just show it off more um, yeah. yeah but infinite money infinite budget to be able to do that that's what we would have done yeah you cut corners in places but yeah that's why i say if if i won the lottery sagebrush would just look better it wouldn't be closed like yeah. we just do more with it um for sure so that kind of that's the branding and i think that helped open up a lot of the like so long as you keep this in the back burner, everything else that's pragmatic to opening your coffee shop needs to be in correlation to, to what how you, you want to present yourself and who you want to be. Which I know this might be jumping ahead, but as we think about our second location, um, it's not feasible to have multiple production facilities. So we need to make sure as we're thinking through, hey, do, what do we want the next location to look like? Yeah. How do we keep the what we are as an in-house roaster um, something that stands out to people when it's not actually in the facility of the next location? Right. I don't know the answer to that yet. And I think actually a helpful segment to um, menu because as I think through the answer to that question, it's a matter of remaining to present like 
continuing to present yourself in the output of what the customer's receiving. Yeah. Which that, and maybe that's even a step back. Like when we wanted to do the in-house roasting, when we were thinking coffee shop, I mean, in a perfect world, we would sell everyone that walks through the front door a bag of coffee and they'd brew it at home. And the next step, everyone that walks through the front door gets a pour over and gets to see the coffee. Yeah. And so we wanted, and, and we built our entire bar around, hey, the landing spot for completed drinks is at the same place where we're doing pour overs to create the conversation around the pour over coffee. Doing, yeah. And that, that whole Almost idea was, hey, we don't want to do pour overs in a back corner of the bar. We don't want them on, at the beginning. When people are standing around waiting, in an ideal scenario, we have a dedicated person doing the pour overs and talking about coffees yeah. with people that are waiting. And so they may come in and get one of our, our more sugary, more popular lattes, um, but that's just step one to driving them towards what our whole mission is about. Yeah. And so there was a lot of intentionality and in just thinking through what do we want to present ourselves and how do we do that in a bar flow? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, Thanks. which yeah. you may just be looking for efficiencies in your bar flow. And if you're trying to do the drive through, the push as many coffees through, then efficiency is all focus. your focus needs yeah. to be. Um, but if you're trying to do something else, like it gets down to bar flow too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the practical. Where do you want people to be? How do you want them to be interacting with each other? And how do you want them segmented from each other as well? Yeah. It's certainly an area of, I think, probably retroactive focus that we had, given that, you know, certainly there was proactive, we want the equipment here, we want the bar to be this long in this, this way, and uh, the intentionality to have the pour overs as almost like a hibachi type of yeah experience for people to come and take a look at what we're up to that's that all came into the fold right away but in hindsight seeing okay now that we have a gauge as to how the bar flow works firsthand with a rush it's a matter of now how do we want to train employees in the certain categories that we have so yeah. register espresso machine and manual brew all those things you know We've it kind of organically developed their own roles to help people towards and segment and training. And I've seen a lot of coffee shops over the years, even even in house roasters move away from a manual brew bar because it's not clean for product for process flow or bar flow. Right. Um, and so we've remained committed. No, we are going to have it. We may overstaff a little bit to make sure that we have people that can dedicate and do a good pour over. Yeah. Um, and that's part of like, it all goes back to know who you are yeah. up front because it's easy to shift and move away from that. Yeah. So here you almost switch spots. Yeah. Oh. Set priorities. So for us, as St. George Coffee, it was a matter of our mission statement as a company is to put on display the hard work of coffee producers. That's front and center on the website. You know, all the details we can give about the coffee we do, and we're focused on presenting that as much as possible. So as a roaster, the that trickles down into the barista position in their ability to prepare the drinks well and to put them on display as much as possible and to be able to talk through kind of someone thinking about their preferences and what coffee to point them to. So that's that's sort of our priority list in, in exactly what you were speaking on too, of like our pour overs are our bread and butter, our black coffees. We have multiple different origins on the menu and the opportunity to prepare them for people and to not only do that, but also bring them with a tray, an info card for them to learn more about the coffee as they're drinking it. Everything was intentional to put on display the hard work of coffee producers. So I think menu circles back to branding in the sense of what exactly is my goal as a coffee shop and what things on my menu will help bolster that goal. Yeah, which that was helpful for you, I remember when we were kind of building out the coffee shop, you're like, what's our mission? I'm like, we don't have a mission. 
And that was my like rejection of corporate America and everyone has to discuss a mission statement. And then at the end of the day, you're like, well, why do you have Sagebrush? And I'm like, we have Sagebrush to put on display the hard work of coffee producers. And you're like, well, they, that's it. Like, yeah, that's our mission. And then everything flew out of that. Yeah. So, and that doesn't mean that it has to be the most direct answer to that mission question every single time. Right. Of, there's also yeah, we don't a, have pastries. Well, and that's interesting. Like, we don't have pastries because we're putting on display hard work of coffee producers. But when you think about coffee producers and how diligent and how hard they work, we want our pastry chefs to be that dedicated to their craft. Right. And so we're looking for people who have dedicated their lives to a craft, not just necessarily doing it in their kitchen, but like yeah. have, have really gone down that path. Yeah. From is, I think, implicitly an extension of your mission to, in the sense yeah. of, um, if you, let's say you were obsessed with coffee, all the finite details, and are really into creating, crafting the perfect pour over, and being able to cup and try different things, then if you desire to bring that into your shop and then are sourcing bare bones, kind of crappy pastries, that dilutes what you're trying to do as a brand. Yeah. And will which inherently affect the customer's, uh, the customer's kind of observation of who you are as a coffee shop. Yeah. Which that's all of this to say, like, I don't, this doesn't mean, hey, you figure this all out and then you don't, uh, it's a lot of negatives in one sentence, but we figured this all out up front and have learned as we went on a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and, and for us, I think the biggest like thing we learned and then had to stop doing was we wanted to go down the path of having a full kitchen and offer food, sandwiches, drive people there. And we just learned at the end of the day, that's not what kind of business we are. Yeah. And um, that was another just telling conversation where, you know, we were, we had our kitchen lead give notice and we were trying to decide what to do. And you made the statement of, you don't love this part of the business and it's taking all of your focus and the customers are feeling that and the employees are feeling that focus on the part we love. Yeah. And it was 45 days later that we were making more money um, on coffee and pastries than we were when we had a full menu. Yeah. Um, and that's just gross revenue, not just profit. Like right. it, it was very quick to say, Hey, when you're focusing on the parts of the business you love, you'll, you'll just be more inherently driven, inherently be more successful. Right. And that's, that's an aspect of when we've gone on origin trips and talked with other people who own cafes and things, it's a matter you see very quickly people who are saying yes to the wrong things and saying no to the wrong thing. Yeah. Because it's people who, you know, they can't stand their employees. They're, I'm thinking of um, the one from Ohio. But yep. The, just how, expressing how difficult it is to run a shop and then, and then talking about all the ways that he's compromising on what he wants to be in a cafe and he's not personally connecting those dots, but you can see very clearly the you, you weren't, I don't think you were made to manage a coffee shop. You were, your focus is in the sourcing and the ability to bring good coffees to the table. Yep. Um, and the more distracted, it was clear how distracted he was. And it, I think shows in the final product of what you get. Yep. Yeah. Which is why, you know, I, you, you need to know your own personal weaknesses. Like if you want to open a coffee shop, know where you're weak and, and either don't go down that path for b your business or hire really, really well to go fill those weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and I think we've, at this point, we've done a good job of both of those. Yeah. Finding people to slot into the roles of where you don't desire to focus as heavily on. Yeah. Yeah. So circling back to menu, I think something that's helpful to note is you really aren't going, you aren't going to make rent 
not offering espresso. So I think we can go down the rabbit trail of how can you tie in what you love about coffee and also incorporate that into what you do with espresso and going into equipment and things like that too. So, um, well, and frankly, I don't know that you'll make rent only selling drinks. Like as you think about menu, um, you know, we just looked at this yesterday, but I think it's 72% of our sales are drinks. Um, and, and I'd be willing to bet that that's more like 35% of our profit. Yeah. Like, it sounds good like, oh, I want to go open a coffee shop because I can sell, you know, a cup of coffee that costs me a buck to make for six bucks. But the reality is you got to pay overhead. You got to pay um, for the syrups, for the cups themselves, which, man, that price has gone up since we opened. Um, pay, yeah, and the like biggest piece is, pastries. yeah, I think it was 23% pastries. That, that doesn't, doesn't equal, that doesn't equal it. Then I must have mis misremembered, but 83. It was, it was 72, 11. So whatever the remaining is pastries. Yeah. So that's, so yeah, maybe it's 13% oh, right pastries. That's kind of where we're at um, in the spread of things. But yeah, it'll soak up too much space. But that's kind of, as you think, through a menu, understand that the focus it actually is helpful having retail because the profit margin is a lot higher. Yep. That can bring in, that's when I think of the model, I think of it like in and out where their highest margin product is their fries. They're charging right. like three bucks for that, charging three fifty for a burger. You go in because it's a great deal for a burger and then you also get fries. And so and you still, margin, you still walked out with $12. Right. Like, and so for out. Similarly, thinking through where you don't have to have the exact same profit margin for every single product you have available, but how do you, how do you predict the ratios to bring the spread of profitability of your company as a whole? Because ultimately, it's not the the seventy five cents you make on the drink; it's the multiple thousand of dollar, multiple thousands of dollars that you walk away with at the end of the month. Right. So. Yeah, which even thinking through, like that was helpful for us in thinking through like how do we build things out and just going, okay, well, if our target, not that we hit it every month, but our target is um, if I, I generally aim for 25% cost of goods, 25% labor, 25% overhead, and 25% profit. And, and in reality, we end up at something like 35 to 40% labor, 20% overhead. 25 to 40 percent cost of goods and 10 percent profit and um and it's if, if you can walk away with a 10 percent profit you're great yeah um yeah and that's um that's a gordon ramsay as he develops a restaurant he thinks through okay week one of the month pays for labor week two of the month pays for overhead week three of the month pays for cost of goods yeah and then whatever i get week four slash five is going to be like that's how he determines how can I be profitable. If if I'm not bringing in revenue on a weekly basis that covers one of these blocks, then I need to start restructuring how I'm. You yeah. know that's a red flag for sure. Yep. Come um, on, but circling back to menu espresso is certainly mandatory. We've seen lots of. I can think of like three off the top of my head of coffee shops who go in with maybe too hyper-specific of an idea of what they want to be, and it takes away from their profitability. You know, if it's like, I think of what's in Coronado, the cold yeah. brew only shop. Oh, yeah. They have espresso now. Yeah, and so, I noticed that last time I was there. There's, there's a piece of not losing sight of who you want to be, but not narrowing yourself into such a harsh niche that you are missing out on customers who could be enjoying what you're all about already. Yeah, and that that's the tempt like temptation, or that's the struggle with anything, because because there's so many coffee shops out there. I mean, I say all the time, I pass seven on the way to mine every morning on my way into work, um, and so there's just so many coffee shops out there that offer so many different things, and many of them offer all of the things. 
mm -hmm. that when you start limiting some of those scopes or some of the scope, um, you suddenly are alienating too much of the customer base. And so there's a tension here of like, hey, we, we want to do this. We don't want to offer the slushies. We don't want to offer the, the high sugar drinks. But if you over limit your scope in zero syrups period, yeah, then, then you're, you're not being it. You're not able to bring customers yep. in. And that's this may be a good place for us. We talk about the the customer funnel, and so um, you know your your vast majority of people that go to coffee shops are looking for a um, a latte that has some sort of a sugar based flavor, and so we want to be able to draw those customers in. Um, and so you, you can't get away from specialty lattes. And um, although I and most of our baristas can't take that much milk, I don't know how many people, how people drink that much milk on a regular basis, but those 80% milk drinks that have a lot of sweetness to them, um, that's just what the majority of the, the world drinks in a coffee shop. And so then trying to narrow them down and encourage them towards um, for us, brewed coffee at home. And not that we're trying to drive people away from the coffee shop itself, but we just know people, um, that's where it's gonna fit your budget the best. You know, we talked about this in a different video of, hey, if you brew at home, you for the price of a daily pour over, you can get like an $80 bag of coffee, um, which basically opens you up to any coffee in the world almost. Mm -hmm. And so, um, being able to have a palate for amazing coffee and then have, you know, functionally the budget for it, you've got to move them into their home. Yeah. So that's yeah. our focus. So it's as far as being able to put on display the hard work of the producers, our bagged coffee does that the best. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that what we do with our creative seasonals and signature drinks doesn't inherently take away from that, but it's not to the same degree as our black coffee. And so we've had multiple customers where they get hooked on some of our addicting drinks and are coming back every day. And like you said, regularly having that much milk and sugar, regardless of how little sugar it is, it's still like 15, 20 grams of sugar. Yeah. That way. So being people get sick of it, they kind of move to unflavored drinks, whether it's just a plain latte or whatever, getting sick of the milk. They move to black coffee if it's an Americano or a drip or a pour over or just espresso. Cold brew. Um, yeah, cold brew as well. And then they start getting, a, then that's where the kind of development of the palate comes in and they start getting a taste for understanding the differences in black coffee and grow in interest of that. And our pour overs, you know, many specialty shops do different espresso, many specialty shops do multiple drips it's whatever that may look like um for us that's our in our pour over bar but being seeing the opportunity to explore different black coffee pushes them to experience what you can get at home and ultimately being able to buy bags yeah. of beans we've had multiple customers work their way through this funnel you know over the course of multiple years and to see that is really cool because that's kind of our goal yeah which it's, our employees fast forward through the puzzle the Fun yeah. the most because like, they're here every yeah it's so funny to see to that and and sometimes we hire employees who start at the oh yeah i've got a great pour over setup at home but a lot of times we'll hire someone who just loves the sweet you know scooter more or whatever drink it's a more inclined yeah. to a caramel based drink and within two or three months of being here they're making pour overs every day yeah and that's ultimately getting understanding of your own personal where are you at yeah. in your journey of kind of developing your palate for coffee, uh, that will be a helpful tell in where you want to your focus be. Because for many, uh, you might not be a roastery and you just want to show what is cool about black coffee in general. And yeah. that may be where your funnel ends. Or it could end at the sweet stuff because yeah. your whole focus is like you may be, hey, I want to train baristas. I'm going to go win World Barista Championships. I want to focus on the barista side of the business. I want to steam milk better than anyone else in the world. Like, and, and we're going to make our syrups in house and we're going to do cocktail style drinks. And, and we never need to go down that funnel. And if that's what you want to be like, great run for it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say 
when it comes to even just thinking through how am I going to develop my menu. I think you need to start with what do we want our espresso-based drinks to look like mm -hmm. um, first and foremost. And and do we, you know, clearly it's almost impossible to open a coffee shop without the traditional drinks. Um, a lot. I've never Cappuccino, seen them. Espresso. Yeah, maybe macchiato. Maybe a macchiato for sure. A cappuccino, probably a cortado. Yeah. Like, um, and so you've got to do something there because people will default there. You probably even need to go down the path of, hey, we need to have a mocha, we need to have a caramel based, and we need to have a vanilla based. Like, that just, Those even even given. when we have on our application, like, we ask on our job application, what drink do you get to when you go to a coffee shop? So many people say a vanilla latte is yeah. my baseline or a or you know, chai. Chai is my baseline. That's another one. You, you kind of can't get away from those because I know for me, like for me, it's most of the time I'll get a cortado because I'm not a huge straight espresso fan. So I'll get a cortado because that gives me the best understanding of what their espresso looks like that fits my palate. And then I'll get whatever their craziest, like what's what cool looks like they're stretching their creativity the most. Yeah. And that's just for me, I like to see what they do. Um, yeah. And if they have a pour over menu, I'll get usually a coffee that I know I've sourced or at least has hit our cupping table because I want to see what they do with it. Yeah. Um, so I, obviously I'm weird because I own a business in the industry, but I generally go to coffee shops and order two or three drinks and, and that's what I'm looking for. Um, and so you want to be able to offer those types of things. Yeah. But um, once you decide, hey, what does our espresso menu look like? You need to think through, okay, now what are the complimentary drinks? Not everyone wants espresso. So for us, we have a pretty extensive manual brew tea menu. We have a pretty extensive even specialty tea menu. Um, and we also have the specialty coffee drinks and we have a really extensive pour over menu. Yeah. And so we've got, we've I don't got about know. as big of a menu as you can have for a specialty shop. Yeah. Because I think foundationally, we just have a lot of space to work with. So we use it to the best. Well, of our and it helps. Too. Like, you know, when we started Sagebrush Coffee about a year and a half later, we started Hackberry Tea and we also have a loose leaf tea business. So it helps that it's like, well, I don't want to stop. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Put that on market that too. and put that yeah. on display as well in it's, the coffee shop. Um, and I think we have some of the best teas out there. So let's right. go show it off. Um, and so that goes back to like, what are we? When we hit the in-house roaster importer, we started going down the, well, not everyone drinks coffee. How do we do this with yeah. tea too? Yeah. Um, and, and ran down that path years ago. Yeah. So, and I think that trickles down into what I found to be really helpful as we were developing our menu is there isn't inherently a right and wrong way to do it to these drinks. They, you know, a latte versus a cappuccino versus Americano, Cortado, plain espresso. They have these general understandings of a latte is going to be bigger than a cappuccino. Um, a cappuccino is going to be hot only. A latte typically can be hot or iced. And the, the milk frothing amount is even there a flexible subjective spectrum that you can plant yourself in as a shop. Yep. The, uh, what's this? James Hoffman gives the analogy of a cappuccino being that of like a lasagna at a restaurant where sure, everyone has a basic understanding of what a lasagna is, but each restaurant brings in their own sort of interpretation of what that looks like. And yeah. it doesn't mean that because they didn't use ricotta that it's not a lasagna anymore, but rather you can they're, see where, where they're approaching it. Yep. And so, that, which I think that, it, you know, the next time we talk about, you know, starting and managing a coffee shop, I think there's a big piece of this that talks about, okay, now once you know what you want to sell, how do you train your baristas, hire your baristas and make sure that you can sell that in a repeatable way? Because yeah. what the last thing you want, and we talked about this this morning in an interview is the last thing you want is customers to come in and go, Oh, I want that made by that guy. Yeah. Like you want to be able to build a menu out that is very easy for you to train and, and, yeah. and have your baristas do it. So I'd yeah. love to talk about that some more next time. Yeah. Repeatable and all and that jazz. Consistent, high quality. For sure. So uh, cool. Think, how about we touch on, I think tying up any loose ends of like platitudes that we give to say, like for us, we're hyper-focused on quality, consistency, all that. Um, at Sage Rush, that's what we focus yeah. on. And 
something Lance Hedrick touches on all the time. He's, he's like, he just says what he likes. He doesn't say this is better than everyone else. So yeah, I think tying that in, it's like, don't don't get don't get caught up in the comparing game because, like we said before, there's you you'd be hard pressed to drive anywhere and not pass five coffee shops on your way. Yeah, and I I think that so like as we think through what did we want to do with our coffee business, we wanted to focus on these check marks, um, and and at the end of the day, like this was what we wanted to be, and and I've said it earlier in the video, I've said it for years is like, I know what my palate is. I know what, you know, we've trained our employees' palates to be. Um, and and so we wanna do that the best we can and just hope that customers like that too. Yeah. Um, and, and the confidence is key. Yeah. As soon as you yeah. lose sight of what you like and what you know to be good, you yeah. know, your palate, if you're obsessed with this, you're, you're training your palate far more than someone who even comes in and gets a cup of coffee every day is because you're dedicating far more mental space to understanding the whys behind what. Well, and that's how to play into the way that we, even just the way we pick or maintain some of our pastries or add-on products. You know, we had a, a pastry product that we sold for a while and then it seemed like the employees kind of got sick of it. And so they didn't sell it because we were sick of it and, and customers weren't enthusiastic about it either. And so there's an element of like, you gotta be willing to constantly evolve as you evolve and, and make sure that you're putting on stuff you're excited about because yeah. that's just gonna be contagious. Yeah, percent. Yeah, making those pivots is key for maintaining, uh, what's the word? Relevant, like yeah. staying relevant as a shop involves you being able to understand that you maybe didn't do it as well as you did. Maybe you didn't do it as well two years ago. Yeah. And not, well, only, not only refining your tastes and your palate and understanding how to do things better, but it's a, what can you develop process wise to lay that out and ensure that your, you know, end of the scope, the lowest tier barista knows exactly how to improve upon what they're doing you know, if you take a look back and you're like, maybe we put too much caramel in our drinks. Okay, then redefine your recipe, dial it in, rewrite the recipe and communicate that. Yeah. It's, it's all a matter of, like you said, being flexible and working to develop yourself as you're developing your palate. Yep. And And never be satisfied. Like, it's not like, hey, we are perfect now, now let's go copy and repeat and send it everywhere in the world. Like, yeah. even even Starbucks is, is evolving. Yeah, yeah, and the that development is part of what makes the industry of coffee so exciting is it seems as though we're only scratching the surface scientifically of understanding how to get to where we are with perfect cups of coffee. Yeah. And, you know, shooting for that is always fun and being a part of that is super fun as well. Cool. So that about wraps up the first workshop. Let us know what you think of it. And if you are excited about this and want to be a part of the conversation, feel free to leave a comment. Give us a like, subscribe. Yeah, tell us jazz. what, like, we want to do a series. We're talking about this of how we do a coffee shop. Um, we'd love to know what's interesting to you. So tell us, leave a comment. What do you want to know next? Yeah. Um, cool. Sweet. <laughs>